Okay, well, folks are still filtering in, but I think we could go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everybody for being here tonight. My name's Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. We're excited to host this discussion with author Ami Weintraub, whose new book, uh, To the Ghosts Who Are Still Living, was just released by our friends at Strangers in a Tangled Wilderness. Firestorm is a 15-year-old uh, radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events uh, that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities, particularly in the South. We're also continuing to do a lot of events like this one um, online, both because we love to be able to connect with authors and audiences at a distance, and because we know a lot of folks in our community um, are still being very cautious uh, in relation to COVID. Um, so if you're interested in signing up for future events, either in store or uh, here on Zoom, uh, just follow us on social media. And I'll also share a link to our newsletter uh, that we send out once or twice a month in the chat. So please note that tonight we are using uh, Zoom's Q&A tool if you have a question at any point, we really would love to hear from you. So um, you're going to be able to find that Q&A tool probably at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will kind of pause uh, to answer questions at the end, but uh, it might work best if you start typing your questions when they come to mind instead of sitting on them. And it's always nice for us to look ahead uh, and anticipate those questions. So we're going to get started. Um, Ami Weintraub is a Jewish anarchist writer and rabbinic student. He's contributed to a number of publications, including Tikkun, Jewish Currents, and New Jewish Voices. Ami is the founder and former director of Ratzon, Center for Healing and Resistance, a Jewish queer anarchist community center in Pittsburgh, and is studying to become a rabbi in the Aleph Rabbinic Ordination Program. Ami's work and community organizing focus on building a world without domination where people can freely connect to their cultures, lands, and bodies. They call the hills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and creeks of Silver Spring, Maryland home. Um, we're also joined tonight by Shane Burley, uh, who is an author based in Portland, Oregon. He's the author of Why We Fight, Essays on Fascism, Resistance, and Surviving the Apocalypse, and Fascism Today, What It Is and How to End It as well as the editor of No Pasaron, Anti-Fascist Dispatches from a World in Crisis. And Shane has appeared in a number of other anthologies and journals as well. Um, and we've had the pleasure of Shane joining us for a few other events, which I believe are uh, archived on our YouTube channel. So go check those out. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass off. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight um, and this book uh, I think is one that if folks haven't already read, they're going to want to read by the end of the night. It is a beautifully written uh, work. So, uh, Margaret, if you'll take us away on behalf of the publisher, Strangers in a Tangled Wilderness. Yeah. Um, hi. And thanks, everyone, for coming to this. Uh, thanks for helping us celebrate this book where... Um, Strangers in Tangled Wilderness is a collectively run publisher of anarchist culture. I don't actually remember our tagline incredibly well. We've been around either for 19 or 20 years, depending on how you count it. Um, but we have a a new collective and a, re a really new reinvigorated push of energy the past two years or so. And we have started publishing a bunch of books. Our goal has always been to find the intersection sort of between anarchist um, culture and like broader culture and other things that we can intersect with. And so when uh, Ami's manuscript came to us, it was pretty much the most immediate and fast and universal. Like it just like kind of went through everyone. Like we don't always, there's a bunch of people in the collective and we're all very busy. And so sometimes we were like, ah, oh, get to it. Right. And everyone read it and was just like, oh no, we have to, we have to publish this. And we feel really honored that we get to publish this. And we feel really honored that Ami has chosen to work with us. Um, and also honored to help Ami put out his first book. Um, and so I, it's a, a, a big thing. And I really appreciate y'all coming here to celebrate that, you know, 
And as Liberty pointed out, this book is beautifully written um, and gets at something that I haven't seen gotten at in print before, you know, and I don't really have that much else to say, except you can you can get the book from uh, Firestorm or from anywhere else. And it's good. And we publish other books, too. But this is the book that you should focus on right now. OK, I'm done. I think Ami goes next. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Ami and thank you both for a beautiful introduction. Um, it's been really fun to work with Strangers in a Tangled Wilderness to publish this book. Um, I think Cassandra and Inim are here and also want to shout out Brooke who was really helpful as well in this whole process. Um, and just, yeah, thank you to Firestorm for hosting this event. Um, it's really exciting to be able to share uh, this book on like a little wider audience through this online platform. And thank you, Shane, for joining me today to be in conversation. Um, yeah, I'm also excited because I see that some of my family is here, like Mariah and Naomi. Mariah is one of my cousins and my sibling, Naomi, um, and some of my friends, I think, in Pittsburgh are here and hopefully from other parts of the country and maybe the world. Um, and um, the this book is like a very intimate offering and it's been really beautiful to share it with family and friends and to have it also uh, go out wider into the world. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to read a short selection from To the Ghosts Who Are Still Living to kind of give a little bit of a flavor of um, the writing that I'm doing and the topics that I'm discussing in this book. Um, just as a basic overview, the book is a um, collection of essays written in in, uh, in three parts. The first part is um, me reflecting on my ancestors and their stories of connection to their lands in Eastern Europe, where my great grandparents immigrated from, um, and a little bit about their story of coming to America and what that process was like for them. Um, and then the second section is about me living in Pittsburgh and um, dealing with like more microaggressive anti-Semitism to like very extreme violent anti-Semitism and sort of also reckoning with like questions of how do I connect to this land here in Pittsburgh that I love um, and how do I and when do I leave um, and then the last section of the book is about me returning with my older sister, Lila, to our family shtetl in Lithuania and to Berlin um, and sort of exploring the question of like, what are these lands today and how do we relate to them today? Um, so it's a, a journey of a book that, um, yeah, has been like really healing to write and I hope also healing or provocative for those of you who are reading it. So I'll start with just one essay. <sighs> so this is the essay to my people in the graveyard in Poland. And I shared the story at the in-person book release on Monday in Pittsburgh that I actually woke up in the middle of the night at like 4 a.m. Um, when two of my friends from Pittsburgh were going to were in Poland and I just woke up and had this feeling of like oh, I need to write a letter to the people in Poland because they're going to be like going to these cemeteries and I want like to talk to like the dead people in the cemeteries and communicate to them so I wrote this essay or like this letter like at four in the morning and like texted it to my friend and I was like are you still there like can you please read these essays or read this essay to the when you're in the cemetery and they're like, yeah, yeah, we're still there. Like, we're gonna go see some more cemeteries. Like, we'll read it to them. Um, so this this piece is really uh, like a a true communication between me and the my people in the graveyard in Poland. To my people in the graveyard in Poland. 
I imagine the trees growing tall around your buried bodies. Their wide leaves shade the long grasses that cradle rows of your tombstones. Maybe there's a big field with streams of sun that caress bursts of wild strawberries or a river rushing by with water from melting mountain snow. Thank you trees and rivers for taking care of these bones. I imagine my people laid into this open earth in a town that once knew your names. Your bodies are covered only in a white sheet you rest so close to the dirt that roots from birch trees share their breath with you. The wailing women cried at your funerals. Tears streamed over their quivering mouths as your families looked on in a stiff daze. The women's cackling songs opened doorways of grief that most people feared would swallow them whole. But these keening women crossed the perilous thresholds for you. I imagine the children leaving stones atop your graves. They turn the rocks in their hands and the jagged edges graze their soft skin. They pile the stones into high mountains only to watch them tumble down into the dust. The, town's bustle, the town bustles with life at the news of your death. Rabbis rush to create a minion, families cook platters of food. White candles burn on wooden mantles. There's smoke carrying the town's prayers up to you. You taught me how to hold the dead and the griefing in my own hands. Thank you for caring for my bones. I imagine you, my people, in the graveyard in Poland, beautiful instead of destroyed. When the overgrown vines entangle your cracked gravestones, I try to imagine it is just the land holding you remembering you when there is no one left here who knows your name. I'm trying to imagine that all my people were buried with white sheets, wailing women, burning candles, children with rocks in their hands. In this daydream, I gather the bones of the forgotten and murdered. My forgotten, my murdered, and I bury them next to you with white sheets, wailing women, burning candles, children with rocks in their hands. I let this dream live in my mind so it may exist somewhere on this earth. I'm trying to bury our pain next to the bursts of strawberries growing in the streams of sunlight, to wash our hands in the rushing snowy rivers to let our mountains of grief tumble and turn into dust. Let us rest in these lands that know our names, cradled by long grasses, shaded by wide leaves, the tall trees growing higher each day. Thank you for caring. Let me know you have received this letter. Ami Lev Wantra Ben Aviva Yosef Aaron. Thanks so much for having all of us here. Thanks so much for having me here um, to be able to join you on the event. Um, I feel really honored. Um, every time we get to talk, I always feels too short. Um, and I would love the opportunity to sit here and, and prattle questions off at you. So you asked me to participate in doing that. So I couldn't say no. <laughs> um, so when we when we were talking before, before this, when we were talking about this event, I was talking about reading the book uh, when I first got it. And it really kind of reminded me, not reminded me, but brought me back to mind of a, an essay I'd read by um, this rabbi, Arthur Green, um, who both know was kind of a neo-Hasidic rabbi and writes a lot about reviving tradition. He was talking about the sort of, um, uh, the lack of ancestral memory specifically to Eastern Europe and our home in Eastern Europe. And how after the kind of uh, the foundation of Israel, but also like the kind of growth of things like birthright, all the energy and money and kind of time and the focus was kind of turned towards Eretz Israel and away from what used to be a pretty big 
sort of world of ancestral connection, people were learning Yiddish or trying to pass it down or having some connection to the past. And it was almost like we kind of cut that off and you chose to do a totally different thing. So what kind of drew you back there in the first place? Where did that call actually come from and why did you go there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, why I go back to Eastern Europe is the question of, of my family and I think of this book in, in total. Um, yeah, just to like flesh that out more, like there's like an essay in here where I talk about like telling my grandmother, Grandma Rinky, that I was learning Russian and her name Rinky is like a nickname from the Russian name Irinka. And like her family, her parents were from Lithuania and spoke Yiddish and Russian. And, and she looks at me like, why would you learn that? <laughs> why would you learn Russian? And it was like this bigger question of like, why are you interested in this place that we left, this place that hurt us so deeply? And for me, like there, there's like, like so many answers to that question. Like one is like, I was talking about this with a friend today that like from for so long in my life, people have like looked at me and asked me, where are you from? It's so, like this first essay in the book, it's like the chorus of the essay is where are you from? Where are you from? And there's always been something about me that I think people are like trying to pin down, like, where where are you from? And that question was just like haunting me. I was like, I don't know. I don't know where I'm from. Like I know I'm from like Eastern Europe, Pale of Settlement areas but like where am I from and I think that's a question that like haunts a lot of um like Ashkenazi Jewish people is like where are we from and there's this um sort of like idea I found very common like as I started talking about this book in my work with people um who are Jewish of that there's nothing to learn about where we're from like where our families came from has been destroyed and decimated and we're no longer welcome there. And this was definitely like, you know, my grandparents and great grandparents attitude is forget about it. Like we're here now, be here. And for me, like the challenge is so exciting to say, okay, I'm not allowed to learn about that place. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to <laughs> anyways. And I also felt like very, very pulled by my ancestors and by the land to return to question to like hold that land with some type of sacredness and so that's kind of like the personal reasons of like why I like went on this what I would call a journey to reconnect with those places and realizing that there is stuff I can learn about it there at the very least I can learn about the trees that grew there the frogs or the flowers and see some of the nature that maybe my family saw as well and then there is also the very conscious like political desire to um, open up a question of like, where do Jews belong in the world? Where can Jews be in the world? And like we were talking before of like, where are we allowed to be actors in the world? And I felt like analyzing like Israel, Palestine and being like, oh yeah, like, there is this Jewish yearning for place and this Jewish yearning for home and like some of that has to do with the fact that like maybe we don't feel totally comfortable in like America or North America or wherever we've ended up um and a lot of that energy has been directed towards like supporting the state of Israel and I was just wondering like you know what happens if we move that energy from supporting the state of Israel and move it back to desiring to connect to the lands that our ancestors came from and how could that like shift the political landscape and I was really inspired by like these stories that my dad showed me about people who came back after World War II like Jews who came back after World War II to like reclaim their homes and synagogues and property and um would be killed by their neighbors or like at at the very worst and at the very best, like run out of town. And so there's something in this that like desiring that land is actually very political. And and like I my dad's done more work on on that side of things, but it is like to, until today, like a very, very contentious thing of like Jews coming back and wanting that land. And how could that desire for that land actually shift and 
interact with like aspects of the tragedy of World War II um, that maybe European or Eastern European or like Western powers like don't want us to touch. Um, and so I'm, I'm really curious about that side of things, like the very material, like what would happen if, if we went back? Um, what would happen if our presence was there in that land again and people had to deal with like living Jews and not just with like the shadow of a people that was once there that they can kind of manipulate to be whoever and whatever they want. Um, so th those are some of the reasons why I've chosen this path and feel very pulled towards it. There's this, I think it's from 1942, this story by um, Chaim Hazaz of where the story goes, there's a, a, a kind of a Jewish battalion of soldiers and they're debating what will happen once we have a Jewish state and how we'll tell the story of Jews. And he demands that no one tell the story of Jewish history, that there is no Jewish history. Actually, Jewish history starts uh, when Israel is founded. Before that, it's not a story of Jewish history because Jews never had agency. It's just mm. what the people did to them. And I think there is... Well, I don't think anyone would say that. I don't think that's like a politically correct thing for people to say. I think there's an undercurrent of that story that goes on a lot. Instead mm -hmm. of looking at those stories from places where we actually do come from and saying that there is something sort of passionately victorious about the world that we built, the lives that we built, what we passed down. Um, so it's sort of like reclaiming, I don't know, the real subjective, like, um, successes we had as a people developing ourselves and coming to know ourselves and celebrating like what we have to be able to pass down um mm -hmm. so we're in the month of Elul um and so I I do Elul up big for folks who don't know who aren't tied into the Hebrew calendar um we have different months um than the Gregorian calendar <laughs> so this is the month of Elul leading up to the high holy day as Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and so a lot of folks kind of take stock of their lives and look for what's called Teshuvah uh, which is sometimes translated as repentance but I think in a lot of ways better to translate as return um, trying mm -hmm. to return to another place of wholeness, maybe return to Hashem, return to God. Um, and so I thought a lot about returning while reading this. Maybe it's where my head's at too, but I think that is, gets to why this is a spiritual project. What we're talking about is about spiritual wholeness. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. see that kind of idea of returning to ancestors so they're present, so they're actually with you? How is that kind of like a spiritual process and how does that show up for you spiritually? yeah that's beautiful um okay and, and one thing also on the the question of like agency in eastern europe also like i think that's what's been also exciting about this ancestor research and this work i've been doing around this topic is to see the places where my family did have agency like my family had a farm called naya vague which means new way um what does that mean like they had a farm that was about like like imagining a new way of things. Like there was a marching band, you know, in my, in Vichy and that shuttle, like there, like my Menachem Nachem of Chernobyl lived in um, my grandfather Bob's family shuttle outside of Kiev. Um, and so I think like repopulating Eastern Europe with actual stories of of living and actual stories of joy and creation um also feels very political to me to me in that sense of like not just allowing agency to be associated with a state like having a state but agency is like how we live and create beauty even even in the hardest times and um so yeah I just wanted to share that as well um and, and I think that relates to like the spirituals like um, I've been, yeah, I guess I'll share the story. I've been, this summer I've been working as a chaplain at a hospital and like really being with people in like a lot of suffering and pain. And I keep thinking about this um, Hasidic story from Menachem Nachem of Chernobyl, um, where, yeah, but Meori um, Naim, that Art Green translated recently um, 
about going down into the pit and like Joseph goes down and who's sold into slavery goes down into the pit and you're down in this pit and you're saying I'm in this worst place ever that's just filled with suffering there's nothing that I can see here that is good and Menachem Menachem of Chernobyl says great you're there <laughs> you're in that deepest place find the spark find beneath like all of this the clipote all of like the heavy shell find the spark that is still connected to our source and our creator and you finding that will let the spark rise up and come back to Hashem. And that story, like I learned that like in the summer of 2020 and um, that's felt like the project, go back into this place, go back into this pit, go back into like this place of shadows, you know, even like boxes of documents that people have shoved away go there, sit there, be in that place of suffering and find the spark, find what is still there and both bring like Hashem down there and bring that back up to Hashem. Um, so that's like the bigger project that I feel like I'm trying to do here. Um, and the smaller project is also like connected to that idea of like, what does agency mean, you know? And how did my people survive? Like we know so much about how they died but how did they survive? How did they live? And I, I think about this phrase that I wrote a long time ago, of like, how did they live long enough to give birth to me? And I was just always so shocked when I would look at um, photos from like the Warsaw ghetto or something. And there'd be like people like building sukkahs in the Warsaw ghetto. And I was like, I don't even want to build a sukkah. Like <laughs> how come these people who are dying are building a sukkah like what is going on here and that's when I started to realize that like asking that question of why why are you doing this in the worst of times made me realize that like that is the thing that can bring life that's the thing that can bring that spark of Hashem back into the world um and so for me like the spiritual project of um being with this not just through the political framework but through the spiritual feels like also the way of allowing my ancestors to speak and allowing their resilience and their strategies for resistance um, and their agency to, to live again in the world. Um, and yeah, and that's feels really important to me. Yeah, I, I also, I read uh, Mayor and Yanim um, when, it, when it first came out. This is us really getting nerdy folks um, <laughs> on Hasidic Oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but they're like commentary on Torah uh, what's called Parsha, which is little Torah portions that folks read every week. So it's sort of like talking about that. But one of the things that drives it together is this effort to kind of search out sparks um, in what feels like the most unholy or the most difficult or most challenging times, because those are essentially where you're going to find that kind of like moment of perfection that you have to engage in. You have to actually be a part of it. Um and I think it's in Tanya, another uh, uh, old Hasidic work, that talks about you can kind of look at the shape of what you've lost to discover who you are, because that's mm -hmm. it's right there. It actually shows you how to recover it because you can see what you're missing. So it sort of ends up being a pathway to rebuilding that kind of wholeness. And mm -hmm. there's this, I, I had a, a friend who was sort of... Um, riffing someone who knows Hebrew much better than I who was um translating the word uh, zadik which technically means righteous um like a righteous person but there's uh another kind of version or, or kind of riff on this that I've heard which is that it is specifically a person who shows somebody else how to save the world and so mm -hmm. I kind of like this idea that we're bound to each other in this that like to enact any kind of change we have to do it together to fill that wholeness a little bit Mm -hmm. yeah and that we can I think this goes into the spiritual as well as like we're not alone in this moment either I think that that so much of like how we understand time and kind of like the dominant culture like I remember when I was a kid I was like oh yeah everyone who lived before me was stupid and they all died and I'm the one who's alive because we're smarter now you know and 
no <laughs> like but I had to really consciously like unlearn that paradigm and say oh okay wait like I'm not alone in this in this time like all of the practices of my people all of the wisdom they have put into those practices like I can invite that into this moment um like I was talking today with a friend about like joyful nihilism this kind of idea of like we don't really there isn't really a future there isn't really a past there is really just this moment and kind of like a messianic like idea is how do we invite the future and the past into this moment like how do we use this moment as like the 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 way to time travel you know the way to to break down um the barriers between then and now um and that's also what this book has felt like has been like a portal back in time future in time but a portal mostly to be able to be in the present with more resource and support from the past um yeah that, yeah that makes sense i hope when, when you are going to the past with it what do you think you've found to bring back i mean the first thing i want to say is the trees um <laughs> but the trees yeah and the frogs and just like the flowers i think a lot about time kind of like having two times like in hebrew like the word olam means world but it also means eternity and the word shana means year but it also means change um so i kind of think that we have like, these two times that exist like shana is like the human time that's like based on how things are changing around us so it's like the year is different the month the my birthday came and went you know i'm getting taller and the olam is kind of like this eternal time that's based more in nature and the earth so like the water has been here from the beginning you know the rocks have been here from the beginning the sky has been here from the beginning and that's like in our mythology even um so to be able to touch those, like the water and say like, you are ancient, I am touching ancientness and to like pull that wisdom into the present and that awareness of its wisdom into the present feels like part of that collapsing of time. Um, and, more, and more practically, that, that's my way out there thoughts, but more practically, um, lots of practices, you know, like, practices for living and practices for survival and just like this deep awareness that like the paradigm we have in today about the unseen world not being real isn't a paradigm that's always existed and to be able to really invite my ancestors into this moment to be able to like talk to the ghosts like this book is addressed to the ghosts is also a way of um bringing that awareness of the unseen world into the moment today and it does, I mean, it it follows sort of a decolonial line. Like when we're talking about, I guess, politically, like it, there we are talking about like a decolonized space. I don't know if space is the right word here, but a decolonized approach and a, that reclamation of tradition. How do you think that, I don't know, creates sort of, I don't know if solidarity is the right word, but bridges gaps with other folks who are trying to reclaim ancestral traditions. Do you think that creates like partnership there? Yeah, I mean, my greatest hope is that it does. Um, and like a lot of this work too comes from the call from like black and indigenous people of like people who are white or who pass as white in whatever capacity to like go back and learn your people's traditions. Like you start to decolonize yourself, you know, understand where you came from and who you are. And that was also a big motivation for me to do this work was like, you know, I grew up in a weird way thinking like I didn't have a culture because I was a white person. I think that's like an experience that a lot of white people experience. And then even though I was going to Hebrew school and I was having Shabbat dinners with my family and like all of this stuff, but I didn't fully understand that, that was my culture. And to really be able to go back into my practices and say, oh, this is my culture. And not only is it my culture, but it's something that for some reason has been very threatening <laughs> to like dominant power for like at least 2000 years. 
oh, that's really interesting. What's here? Why is this so threatening? What is so threatening about it? Like, what happens if I touch it and open it up? And what's going to shake in our dominant structure? And that's been like a really intriguing question to me. And then being able to like see, I don't know, like I speak cautiously on this only because I haven't done like a ton of knowledge and or reading and work around decolonization specifically, but like being able to see also points of connection of similarity between ideas and practices and ways that shifting into some of these mindsets that like I see in like neo-Hasidic thought because I'm my school is a neo-Hasidic school, which is why I refer to that more frequently. Um, and seeing how they do like challenge the paradigms that are part of like a more colonial mindset um, makes me feel like there's some there's some fire here and there's some spark here. Um, and I think just overall, like a reason why I'm excited about like this whole idea of like Jewish anarchism specifically is um, I hope that it opens up more spaciousness for um, spirituality and magic and ritual to be part of our, our political work because I think denying that aspect of culture and human existence pushing that out of our political spaces is I think for me like also a, an act of uh, colonization in a way because it's denying that like I think I've been really struggling with this summer is that I think a lot of people think that like being Jewish is just a religion. And so white Christians will be like, oh yeah, like I'm white and my religion is Christian. You're Jewish and you're, really, you're white and your religion is Jewish. And it's like, yes. And like Jewishness is like my history, my ethnicity, my culture, my people, like it's not just my religion. And to say like to have Jewish people be included in space and is to allow for like the spaciousness of our culture to be here, which means our languages, our spiritual practices, our holidays, our ritual, which may in some lenses be considered a religion, but that honestly, that label was only applied to Judaism by Christianity so that it would be like, like seen as like, like in parody. Um, so, to kind of detach this idea of like religion equals like something that is always bad. And to say that a lot of people have spirituality and connection to earth and God as intrinsic to their culture and to who they are as a people. And we need to include that in our organizing work. Um, feels like a point of connection, like around like questions of decolonization. I think the like the framework like you're saying that we're even provided to talk about Jewishness is not our framework. It's not like indigenous mm -hmm. the way that we think about it in any way. So it's hard, particularly as it became, I was almost about to say more religious, but that's not it. As I became more involved in Jewish life, communicating it to folks who didn't have that experience could only, you know, compare it to Catholic school or something. It was like a very different thing. And it took a lot of it had a lot of barriers and there was also a certain kind of like you mentioned hesitancy about religion in left spaces that's then getting projected onto us so people would be surprised when i would have a spiritual practice that has an obligation that creates like a barrier sometimes you know i can't go something on a certain day or i can't eat a certain kind of food or i have to do x y and z before i walk into a space and they associate that level of religious religiosity with I don't know conservative politics or something like that. So they don't know how to relate to it, and then we're trying to break through that and 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 mm -hmm. have it be present in some way. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really interesting when I was in. I was in Berlin at the beginning of the summer and did actually the first book talk I did there, in a room of like mostly Germans with some like North American Jews and some European Jews, and I started um, by singing. And inviting in like the spirits of the earth and the spirits of my ancestors and the spirits of our angels, which is just like a practice that I've developed when I do ritual space. And that I, you know, read this book and it's intense, especially for Germans to be hearing. And the main comment that people had at the end was, I've never been in a space that was spiritual like this. You know, I've never been able to like, I've never seen a political space hold this type of 
spirituality and what I said was like this spirituality like this is this is how I express myself as a Jewish person so like if you really want to have Jewish people feel comfortable in your spaces like you need to allow this to exist here um and that's just like a bigger question that I have around like if we look into the histories of like why and when and how these our spiritual practices have been um taken from us or like not allowed like it follows so much of like the history of industrialization the history of the development of capitalism the history of like patriarchy um and that's like an experience that like is common across like colonized places and peoples so there can be this idea that like religion is this like like this superstitious thing that we need to like get out um but that's like denying that those like that mindset comes from you from like a place of like like being embedded in like industrialization and capitalism and patriarchy and yeah I hope that like this work can like open some more space for how our connection to the earth and to spirituality and to our peoples can be like a challenge against those forces yeah I think you know it's I think it's also projected back onto Jewish life in a way too. the other direction, you know, as I spend more time in kind of a Jewish institutional life. Um, I wouldn't say I have barriers there, but it's a challenging relationship. It's, it's one where like, we're kind of pushing to make space too, because these institutions are forged in the same culture. Everything else was forged in making compromises, changing over time, capitulating with power. Um, and so that's sort of what you've done with, with rats on how did, how have you felt sort of trying to build I don't know, rebuild or or kind of construct a more inclusive and radical kind of Jewish civic life. Yeah, I like that. Jewish civic life. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so these are the ideas I've been thinking of for a long time. Um, it, it's fun to talk about it. Um, and so that all kind of came, like all of these ideas have kind of like, culminated around like like you're saying like okay that's the theory but what's the praxis you know like how do we like enact this in the world um so I, I have felt like really excited about like creating like diasporic diasporic community that addresses some of the needs that arise when people have like a Jewish people have like a yearning for Israel which can be like a need for safety and a need for um cultural expression and so those two things and seeing this reconnection to kind of like a more mystical Judaism as having the possibility of being like a very powerful political force um, made me and others in Pittsburgh think about like what does a space look like that's based on this so myself and I see Ben is on the call Ben Case and um, others in Pittsburgh decided like let's create like a space that really um, can bring us into like the depths of this sort of mystical Jewish culture and spirit and allow us to express our culture fully and let's build something that's going to keep us safe too especially in Pittsburgh so that created a project called Rotzone Center for Healing and Resistance, um, which is a political force in the sense of like having eyes on fascist organizing, trying to be involved in anti-fascist organizing, and also is very deeply like a cultural resource center for Jews on the margins of the community. Um, and like, it's just like really, the project has just really inspired me and like I'm no longer part of it because I moved out of the city, but it's still continuing. Um, and like, I do see and really believe in its ability to sort of speak this vision of like anarchism and this vision of Jewish life as like something that can hold this vibrancy of culture as 
a way to nourish ourselves and to resist um, the dominant structures that are threatened by it. Um, and I, yeah, I hope to like see more projects like that come up around the country and the world and it, it is here and there and that's really exciting. And um, I think like via the avenue of anarch anarchism where we're um, encouraged to, you know, self-organize and encouraged to take ideas and apply them in our own contexts. I really believe in it spreading and hoping that it does. Yeah, I mean, I think building a Hamish, like some kind of home for folks, is just an essential part of that. And I think also in like the diaspora context that you're talking about, it's not, um, it's about finding home where we are now um, in the traditions, the people and ancestors we have. Um, folks, put questions into the chat if you have questions, either the Q&A function or pop it in the chat, and I will go through them when we get a, a kind of density. Um, I think you and I first met when we had, um, we were at an event hosted by Ratzon, and we were talking about Jewish anti-fascism, um, which I think like, it's sort of been like an ongoing discussion I, in the same way that Jewish anarchism is or like, what does it mean to be kind of like authentically Jewish anti-fascism or what does Jewish anti-fascism look like as sort of separate from just kind of like the larger anti-fascist movements. And I, it's something I'd be curious what you would say about, I think it's when I think about this, it brings us back to like an older kind of sense of Jewish political consciousness. Like historically, if you look, especially look in like Britain or parts of Western Europe, when you look at anti-fascist movements starting in the 30s up through maybe the 60s and 70s, um, those were largely Jewish movements. Those are largely in Jewish mm -hmm. neighborhoods, they're Jewish organizations, they're Jewish leadership. It's part of the Jewish left and the Jewish move to the left. And it really isn't until there's a recalibration of what Jewish safety means away from what we'd know as anti-fascism uh, to Zionism or to other kinds of politics to basically see Jew the safety of Jews that's being lodged in Israel as a nationalist project versus in the kind of solidarity model of anti-fascism before. And so I feel really inspired to kind of pick up that older mantle and bring it back into the present and say, actually, I do invest my sense of safety as a Jewish person in solidarity or in that kind of sense of community, mm -hmm. building community power on the ground. So I wasn't sure how you kind of thought of this idea of Jewish anti-fascism. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think sometimes when I think about this shift in history, I think a lot about like the history of how Jews have been welcomed into places and why and often um like in Europe Jews would be like allowed to like live in a place um because their presence would benefit in some way like the the ruling class whether or not that was true or not like that was kind of the permission granted for that reason and as and once Jews presence wasn't benefiting the ruling class, um, they would be kicked out of that place. Um, and that, that's probably a simplistic uh, history, but that's generally what I've learned and heard. So kind of thinking about like, if we have that frame as something that has never changed, which I think is like really scary for Jewish people to think about because I think we kind of have been like, oh, we're in America and look, like we have, our, we have agency, we have our own power, we have autonomy. Um, but like, like the thing that kind of haunts me is like how is our agency power autonomy or like the idea of that like who is that serving like is that are we here like still on a basis of permission and I see like that shift that you're describing of like at one point like we were like anti-fascist and like in solidarity with like others and at another point like that changed to be like, oh yeah, let's support this like state building project backed by the West or like, oh yeah, let's like, um, I don't know the other things that you described as well. Um, let's like align ourselves with whiteness, you know, like those are all things that for like Jews who could pass as white and could be white, those are all things that benefit like ruling power ultimately. Um, so kind of like when I think about today like what that strategy has meant and what we do with that now is to really 
really be conscious and think about like, how do we actually take our autonomy back? How do we actually take our agency back and not just be used by ruling powers for their own benefits and gains? And even the Jews being welcomed into America, it's like, oh, cool, we have this population of people who can work in our factories, you know, and who can be this, these low wage workers. Um, and when that stopped, started to change and Jews had more class mobility, like that was also when perhaps like the role of Jew is more questioned in society. So yeah, like the central question for me is like, how do we not, like how do we stop aligning ourselves with <laughs> that, uh, with the desires of the ruling powers, whatever that might be. And how do we hear our own desires and align with our desires? And um, and I think that leads to like more solidarity with others who are also facing, um, yeah, like uh, who are being threatened by uh, oppressive powers. And for me, that leads to like, let's build an anti-fascist movement where like our desires are centered um, along with the desires of other people who are who are facing violence from fascism. Um, and that to me feels like a path forward that's like exciting and has potential. Um, and yeah, I just feel like there's, there's no easy path to get the things that we need in life. Um, so like creating an anti-fascist Jewish community feels like a hard path, but that feels like the difficulty feels like the right answer also. Yeah, I think, I always kind of understand anti-Semitism as a, a threat on the continuity of Jewishness and not continuity like we often hear continuity talked about in Jewish spaces, but just the presence of Jewishness ranging from on the one hand, the kind of like lethal presence of Jewish people, but all the way to the presence of Jewishness as distinct identity, practice, traditions that are handed down, sort of like Jewish flourishing. And there's a direct proximity to that feeling of safety and the hiddenness of Jewishness. And to like really reclaim that, I think people are nervous about, in a way, not just public displays of Jewishness, but to live a really kind of Jewish life that actually runs up against cultural mores, that actually does create like sort of like social problems in that space. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we don't have the, or because we have taken a different approach or a lot of institutions have taken a, not an anti-fascist approach, but a kind of assimilationist approach, we haven't actually built up the like capacity to keep ourselves safe in that way, it feels like. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, and this is, I think, a conversation lots of folks are having with the increase of anti-Semitic incidents and attacks, but just kind of the ubiquity of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories is it's not mm -hmm. we're not as safe as we thought this strategy was going to get us and in reality we haven't built the bridges that would have kept us safe over those those many years yeah and like I think the scary thing I don't know like I I say this and I think this is an oversimplification at the same time of course I think one of the scary things is like when we look at like how Jews are being used in this moment that it's it's so parallels to like how Jews have always been used like throughout like a lot of um, European history. And again, always might be, is always like the wrong statement. There's more nuance than the word always provides. Um, but yeah, like Jews are the buffer between <laughs> um, the buffer for the, the, for the ruling class and the thing that people can point their fingers at so the ruling class doesn't um, have to be actually bothered or, or affected by the unrest that they're creating. Um, and I think it's, it feels really scary to maybe see our current moment through that light, because I think that feels like, I mean, when I think about it, it feels like a failing, you know, it feels like, oh man, no, we came here for it to be different. Yeah. And what do we do if it's, if it's not that different? Um, but if it is different in some ways, you know, like I could go to college and like, they're not discriminated against on a daily basis like that is different and what more do we need to fight for right like that can't getting an education and being able to work whatever job I want like is that the true like freedom that I want as a Jewish person and like I don't think that is and what you're describing of like not being hidden anymore like like I can just feel that in my body you know like Mm. that's the freedom 
Well, we, we had a few questions come in. Um, so there was one really interesting one. So it was, doesn't the idea of American Jews going back to Eastern Europe to show people there are Jews there and won't be erased, erase the fact that there are Jews currently living in Eastern Europe, living there right now, uh, which is something that folks do bring up about um, or in Eastern Europe when we're talking about this, which I think is kind of an interesting question of like, how do we relate to Jewish communities that actually are in some of those places? I know did, when you were there, did you encounter Jewish communities living in the places that you went? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that question. I feel that in two ways, like one, I was really conscious, like I did this book talk, like I mentioned in Berlin and I was, I felt really weird about it at one, on one hand and also really good about it on the other. Like, and I said during the event, I was like, I am not from here. Like I'm not in this culture with you. Like this is your culture. This is your city. I'm, I'm very aware and like throughout the book I also talk about this too but like I'm not from there and yet I am really affected by what's happening there and the conversations that young people my age in Berlin are or aren't happening or are, 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 aren't having really affects me and that's like the weirdness of this like trans border identity that doesn't quite fit in with like how we're supposed to be categorized right now in the world um like I'm supposed to just consider myself American you know um so I, I do grapple with that a lot of like what does it mean to not really be be from there and that there are people and there are Jewish people who are from there and like have a story to tell and and part of the book also it talks about I connect back with my family who's still in Lithuania and they're kind of like these long lost family members that we I found and we found and we got to reconnect and I went to Vilna and saw their community center and we went back to the shuttle together and like learn more about their lives, you know? And, and I think it is super important to not erase like the lives, the Jewish lives that are still being lived in Eastern Europe and to not just like prance in as Jewish Americans and um, cover, cover that reality of an ongoing Jewish presence and like, what happens there affects me still. And I'm constantly grappling with being affected by a place that's that I've never lived. And that's a, it is a weird feeling to have. Um, so that's kind of where I've been left with that. It's, there seems to be this, I don't know, where Judaism can be like a tool to connect with folks at that great distance in the same way that I know, like not just Yiddish, but Hebrew and other folks that had common language for folks in different geographies to have some kind of common connection. Because I think without like the ability to connect with like distant family like that is a really incredible thing that like I feel like I'm sort of been gifted with the tools to do a little bit of to do a little bit mm -hmm. of like archaeology in my family and build those connections because there's something really present about that in Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, was, yeah, because my family in Lithuania, we were like, you know, talking in Yiddish together. We were like talking about like, what'd you do for Rosh Hashanah? Like my, one of my cousins there like sent me like apples and honey, like a picture of apples and honey and was like, happy Rosh Hashanah. And it's like, like you're saying, like it's a language that we can pick up and and keep speaking with one another. Um, yeah. So someone was asking about how queer and trans politics are intertwined with Jewish resistance and what role Judaism can play in current movements for queer and trans liberation. That's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, like there's a joke in stuff that I saw a meme once that was like, or like maybe a friend also asked like, how come all Jewish people I meet are trans? <laughs> um, <laughs> so like that's happening. <laughs> um, let me read the question again, just so I make sure I answer it correctly. I mean, I think that in a way, it's been a a, a, a way of querying kind of like, quote unquote, religious spaces or maybe interreligious spaces, because in those spaces, if I'm ever in them, that is being led by Jewish 
congregations, like in every situation, right? Like it's always being led by Jewish congregations out of Jewish caucuses and things like that. And that's made such a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even like this summer, I was doing this chaplaincy program. That was like me and another Jewish, like urbanic student and two um, uh, of, sorry two people who are in school to become like a deacon and a minister through like presbyterian and lutheran movements and me and the other jewish person were queer and i'm trans and um even like our presence in the space is being like yeah like we're we're out and open queer and trans clergy future clergy members and like our religious world is accepting that um i could see how that was like starting to like even at the very basis, like these people were very accepting and, and wonderful in that way, but um, gave no excuse in a sense, you know, like we're being accepted and, and we're here with you. We are clergy members with you. So how are you going to, um, how are you going to, how is your movements going to handle that, handle that there are trans and queer rabbis in the world who are going to be your peers as clergy, you know? So that's like a really small micro example, but um, yeah, I mean, I have my own, like I'm trying not to go into this huge tangent about Jews and birds and mud um, and Mashiach, uh, but that's like my bigger answer of like how <laughs> trans- I'm here for it, yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here being like, don't talk about it on me. And I'm like, oh, maybe you should talk about it. Um, but yeah, I've done like a lot of research on like <laughs> potential like Jewish views around transness specifically um, because a lot of cultures around the world like view people who are trans as like having like certain like spiritual like proclivities and having like they have the special roles in the societies. And so I was very curious if that could potentially apply back into Jewishness um, and like doing kind of like a more poetic reading of some sections of Talmud like I saw this really beautiful connection between like trans people and twilight and birds. Mm. Um, like trans people were constantly being juxtaposed next to birds. And then I like did some more research on birds and um, saw that there's like this myth of in Jewish tradition of birds being like this mixture of like, um, sorry, fish are made from water in this mythology. And like animals are made from mud or are made from dirt and earth, but birds kind of like go between water and earth and sky and they're made from mud, like this mixture of things. And birds in Jewish tradition and this idea have this ability to actually fly up to Mashiach and sit in this golden nest next to Mashiach. And birds can take our prayers and fly up and tell them to Mashiach birds can represent soul, like all of these like really highly spiritual things. Um, and trans people in parts of Talmud have this ability to like move in and out of like sacred spaces that are like sometimes harder for cis people to move in and out of actually. Um, so I, I share that because it's a little bit of a tangent, I think. Um, and I share that because like I think there is really deep roots in Jewish tradition that like honors trans lives and there's even like in part of Talmud it's like I, I'm going to not quote this correctly but there's this, this idea of like um, at the very like no matter what like we decide on like it as rulings about like how a trans person um, or like in this case sometimes it's more like intersex person like what their halachic status is, their life is sacred, their life is important, and you shall not kill them in the same way that you shall not kill any other person. And so that being like the basis of, of the conversation around Jewish transness, and then everything else stems from that. And that is so counter to how trans people are seen in our world right now, and how trans people are viewed by Christianity. Um, so again like this whole bigger idea of like what are the paradigms within Jewishness that like really do threaten our 
current dominant culture and society and what happens if we like you were saying Shane like become unhidden if we uncover ourselves if we uncover these pieces of our tradition and let them breathe and how how can that be part of our liberation yeah it, I feel like also like I think um uh, there's a book that came out called Trans Talma, I think came out last year, Max Strasfeld, and talked a little bit, he talked a little bit about this in there, but you know, one of the things is that the Jewishness sort of redraws the lines of scripture and meaning and what the meaning of religious spaces are away from what people expect them to be. And that is why it actually opens up a lot of chance for people to kind of come back to a, their spiritual selves because it shows that how this can happen. And I think of like, you know, for example, like the way that a lot of Jewish readings of Torah being so significantly different than the kind of political projections that are put on them and by a lot of right-wing Christian folks or a lot of evangelical churches and stuff, it being so profoundly different, I think that has created a, a real challenge to the kind of hegemony about how these ideas are discussed. Um, and that mm -hmm. in a way is kind of the vanguard of it because we're challenging the same texts in some cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, what does, again, like, what does it mean that like, like we've been challenging that way of seeing the world for 2000 years, you know, and and that like in, in America, like Christianity is the dominant force. So like, what's our power? Like you can even see like in the reproduction, reproductive rights movement of like Jewish people saying like, no, actually like the right to an abortion is our religious right. And so how do we frame that like, no, like, caring for trans people is our religious right. And that's like really like playing into, there's some type of like respectability politics in that type of framing. And it's like a language that we can speak that could um, be part of whatever's to come next for trans rights and queer rights. Like a particularly dangerous way of doing it because it goes directly at the foundations of their their claim to moral certitude you know like it really totally. on it. Um, and if people want to um learn more about this like i've i studied with rabbi mike moskowitz who um he's like a ultra-orthodox rabbi whose son came out as trans and he like is like a trans talmud scholar now like he he studies rabbi mike moskowitz studies trans talmud and He's just like amazing. Um, so I suggest that people study with him and read some of his work. So Hunter, I had a, a really great question. Um, so how and where do you hold your grief of cultural and spiritual loss by way of our ancestors' commitment to survival through assimilation? I think you mean like, like they actually had a commitment to survival through assimilation. Mm -hmm. And how did your body feel about going back to Eastern Europe when you were there? Yeah. Hi, Hunter. Um, <laughs> how and where do you hold your grief of cultural and spiritual loss? Yeah. Um, yes, there's a lot of grief in, in seeing how, how our ancestors had to survive. I think that's one way to put it. Um, like I, in another essay I wrote for something else, like I, I think I talk about like, um, like I want to like hold our tradition, but like it's handed back to me in in shards of glass. Um, and I ask like, why is it broken? Like, why is it so broken? Um, so I think like a lot of, um, a lot of the grief. I'm able to kind of process it by also understanding that like, yes, my ancestors had a choice to assimilate and like they chose that. And also like, it wasn't only their choice. And so like, I think some of like this resistance work against like Christian hegemony also comes from like acknowledging like what was the pressure around them to make that choice, you know? Um, so like, as I fight back against like Christian hegemony or engage in anarchist work, it feels like opening more, more of that spaciousness um, to, to not like blame my ancestors for the assimilation that they, that they underwent, um, but to understand why that happened. 
and to understand that some people also chose that like joyfully and willingly like one of my cousins is a catholic priest and he's doing that happily and that's his life you know um so also like and to honor that like just like there's also the agency and autonomy that like we should have as humans to like make choices for our lives that like make us feel whole and good um like that feels important to me too um and how did our, my body feel going back to eastern europe oh uh, it was so cool it felt so good um <laughs> i was texting my family the whole time i was like oh my god like there's kombucha and kasha and mushrooms and like all of this like weird and like beets and like all of these weird foods that I've just been like eating so much of and finally seeing like everywhere around me and like linden tea and like just like it felt like I was like nourishing myself very very deeply like I was sitting at a cafe by myself in Vilna and um before my sister got there and was eating like a bowl of kasha which I had been like eating a lot of um prior because of it became gluten-free and like all of this stuff and I just had this feeling of my ancestors have been feeding me for so long um and I get to come back here where like I can be fed more deeply um and there was parts also where I felt like super dissociated and really panicked and anxious and there's some like parts of eastern Europe like a friend of mine went to like the border of Belarus and Poland to like do immigrant support work and I was just like or like refugee support work and I was like I can't do that like I I can't be in those forests helping people cross borders like it's just too charged with this history that I haven't fully processed yet but I'm so glad you're doing it I just know my body can't handle that um and this last time I was in Berlin I just threw up and got really sick and I think like after I went to services at a at like one of the first synagogues that reopened after World War II, I went to services and came home and just like threw up. Um, so it feels like a really big range of bodily reactions. But now it's like when I I used to have this like gaping hole inside of me that was just like sorrow and grief. Whatever I would think about. Um, uh, Eastern Europe and now that I've been there it feels like it's filled with like something to stand on and I don't feel that same grief anymore and that feels really significant. It feels like part of this question is this this question of how do you like if you are bringing someone from the past back into your life how do you like live with these new people in a way or people that might new to you you know like how did you how do you honor someone from the past that lived in a way that you choose not to live or made choices mm -hmm. that are different like how do you honor that and i i think that's really tough i mean i know like with you know family members of mine that have passed away it takes you know the rest of my life figuring out how to live with them now you know mm -hmm. yeah how do we transition with their transition um yeah and I also had to like live with, like, I think for a long time, I was also really upset that like my family immigrated. It was like this weird feeling that like, of course, I'm so glad my family like survived, like didn't have like survive pogroms and rape was my direct like ancestors were able to come here before World War II. Like, I'm so glad they didn't have to go through that and that like I'm alive, you know? And I think there was like part of my body that I didn't even realize was like really sad that we had left um and just letting myself be with that sadness and then to like bring in my logical mind um and say like and they did that to, so you could live um has been part of the healing uh with, yeah a lot of somatic therapy also <laughs> How did you choose how to kind of tell, like, I guess what stories, how did you choose your stories and how did you choose like how you were going to tell this? Because it's so creatively kind of woven together uh, with different voices and stuff. So how did you kind of put together the process of it? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think for like my whole life, like I've processed like my inner world and outer world, I guess, process the world with writing. Um, and it's actually kind of funny, like the first, my dad gave me this like writer's notebook when I was seven and he, I went back and looked at it like maybe when I was like in high school. And the first thing I wrote in that notebook was an interview I did with my grandfather about his dad. <laughs> So it's just like this really interesting, like, I think it's always been on my mind, I guess. Um, so yeah, I processed the world through writing and eventually like I, um, like one of the essays called Coiled Potential um, talks about this moment during the um, 2020 uprisings when uh, like these fascist Nazis like came to my neighborhood in Pittsburgh and, and like almost shot my friends um, and I was there when it happened and that experience itself like really like ripped me open um, and that was the moment when I saw the writing that I had been doing about my ancestors and realized that like I needed to share this writing I needed to share this perspective I needed to have it out in the world um and then I look back and I was like oh I already have so many essays that like I've been writing on this topic of like fascism or my family or ancestry I need to like collect it and then it was just really sitting down and just letting stories come through me like some of them feel like almost like channeled stories from my ancestors um some of them feel like like the one about, like, I think it's called Here and Now, about me um, being at Pitt and experiencing a lot of, like, microaggressive anti-Semitism. Like, that was just a lot of, like, anger that I had that I needed to get out. Um, so I think it was, like, this combination of, like, what stories do my ancestors want me to tell and what stories, like, feel like there's, like, this anger inside of me that still needs to be expressed. Um, and yeah, I was saying this to someone the other day, like everything in here is all that I want to be in here. Like there's nothing that's like, feels extraneous and there's nothing that feels like I left out. And I think that's because it was like in conjunction with like my ancestors and Hashem and something greater than me that was kind of like helping me to discern and write and choose what to put in here. Do you know what you'll be working on next? that Margaret keeps asking me <laughs> I mean I guess like my next the next thing I'm like super interested in which like uh if anyone's interested in this like hit me up um kind of like the, the yeah one of the things that feels very like unfinished is there are like a lot of Jewish bodies that were not buried correctly um during and after the holocaust in eastern Europe and I just like have this big feeling of like many, many, many souls being in on that land and needing support and help to like transition to the next world or to find rest. Um, and I've talked with some other people who've also had that same feeling and experience when they've gone to Eastern Europe. Um, so I feel like that's the next thing that's like calling to me in life is to like support those spirits and ghosts um, and build some type of like uh, movement of Jewish people who are doing that type of work. Um, and so maybe that'll include a book. Um, but that's the next project on my mind. I mean, I think that that's, in a way, it's <laughs> a valley kind of like political expression too, you know? Um, and uh, Cause that's, this is one of those places that like a kind of a, about affirming difference and our uniqueness that that is one of the more kind of key examples of it. We just made living wills and stuff with this in mind of being like, we need to communicate to those in our lives that don't understand this, like, you know, mm -hmm. how we want to, uh, how we want to end. Mm -hmm. I guess one more question. Oh yeah, this is, Oh, this is a banger of a question. Okay. Do you want to read it out? I can, I can, I can read it out. <laughs> so, so how do we reconcile the hope from Mashiach 
slash revolution. That's really good. Um, with the reality of the Shoah, the unburied bodies and unhoused spirits, not to mention the ongoing genocide against Black and Indigenous peoples today. Yeah. Do you, I mean, Shane, do you want to like answer any of this? <laughs> I'm happy I mean, to, but I also, you're like, a, I also want to ask you questions, but I know that's not what we're doing tonight. Um, go, go for it. I, no, I mean, I think, so for folks who aren't kind of aware of, of what Mashiach means, means something like Messiah. It could mean um, a, a kind of healed world or a paired world or a more whole world. It depends on how we're kind of like reading that. So I've seen, you know, for example, revolution be sort of um, the conceptual accompaniment to Moshiach as a mythic figure or maybe as a real figure or as an in-person figure. And so I think, how do we reconcile the hope for a revolutionary transformation of the world with the reality um, of what happens when it hasn't been transformed? And I think that is, in a way, the question that we have to ask about all of this. You know, we the idea that we're trying to heal the world towards something better always has to be balanced against the fact that we actually live here and now and have a certain amount of not knowing us. I have a great deal of faith that we're moving in a direction, a revolutionary direction, but I don't know that for certain. No one can say that for certain. And so having to hold that, I think you have to anchor your hopes in more immediate things that you can kind of see and touch. And that's why I think being grounded in community and being gracks, grounded in acts of loving kindness, but ones that are like really practical and you can kind of see the results of, because I do think it's those kind of cumulative acts or mitzvot will actually kind of bring about that change. So I think mm -hmm. I feel like I have to be tangible with the people I'm with to see those things um, because the bigger, the kind of overwhelming weight of history is like could be too much to kind of maintain that eyes on the future. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, and, and that makes me think about um this idea of, meets vote that we currently have so this is just like the idea i'm really obsessed with right now which is that this idea of meets vote being like commandments and being like something that we are obligated to i just learned that this was invented in like the 1800s by a group of jewish um philo like jewish philosophers and scholars who wanted to appeal to protestants in europe um because they were th these jews were like how do we get emancipation in Europe? Oh, what if we are like reconstruct Judaism to be more like Protestantism, like have this like ethical, moral sort of like bend. But prior to that, like mitzvot was this like seen as this kind of like mystical, like important human need to like have, have the ca capacity of bringing down like Shefa, bringing down like God's flow into the earth and into like the world. Um, and if we didn't do meets vote like that, like then this flow couldn't happen. So I, I just feel like the way that you describe meets vote also is like having this tangible, this tangible like impact on the world, like feels so aligned with that idea of like meets vote as being like a conduit for, um, for Mashiach to come, for like this flow to like come into this world today right now not necessarily in the future and today right now like even in like the darkest pits you know even in like the suffering we can do this mitzvah that can bring down this flow um and that's that's like what i hope for in the world is like this kind of like joyful nihilism of like we don't know if there's a future we don't know if there's a past we just know that there's this moment and how do we bring as much um, evolutionary potential into this moment as we can. I always think to I I made minion with some folks from um from some Labavitch Hasidim when I was at Occupy Wall Street because they would come out and, and hand out roses and stuff and and help people put the filling on, uh, and I always put the filling on them at any chance I can, and um, and they were talking about you know and they're sort of debating this like old kind of. Kabbalistic debate about whether or not, like when we're trying to heal the world and mitzvot, engaging in mitzvot, these commandments um, does that. It helps to rebuild those shards and piece them together. Will we know which one does it? Like which act mm -hmm. actually brought us there? And of course they don't know. So I say, well, if you don't know, what do you do? They're like, you just wake up and you do it again. 
Um, and so I, uh, I, I, I think you have to be committed to the waking up and doing it again. Mm. And I love that, like the waking up also. <laughs> like to realizing that our, yeah, like to like the waking up of our awareness and consciousness over and over and over and over. Oh, wow. We are, we are tapped at time. Yeah. This is really fun. <laughs> Thank you for, for letting me speak on these subjects. Thank you for, for letting me join you here for this. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Time really flew. Um, and thanks to everybody in the audience who submitted thoughtful questions. This was such a great conversation. Thank you all so much for being here. And just another reminder to folks that um, if you have not already, definitely pick up a copy of this book. If not from Firestorm, then direct from the publisher. Um, you will not regret it. No regrets. <laughs> And thank you to Cassandra, who I think might still be here, maybe isn't, who uh, designed the cover. Um, oh, that's, that's awesome. Really beautiful. Yeah. And the back is beautiful too. Fantastic. Any final words from anyone? Otherwise, I think it's time for us to sign off and go on our ways. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, Thanks y'all. for coming. <laughs>